I'm Lindsay Orbeda, and you're listening to the Keto Dietitian Podcast, based in San Francisco, California. I'm here to break down peer-reviewed research for all things keto, making sense of the science so you can apply it to your life and be awesome. Today, I'm talking all about exogenous ketones, which I've done an insane amount of time reading and learning about and assimilating into everything that I understand about ketogenesis. Today, I have a new co-host for today's show, and she's not only an expert in the field of exogenous ketones, but a woman who I happen to adore. And I'm really psyched to introduce you all to Samantha Rose, a health and wellness coach, and also a badass single mom. Sam, I'm honored to have you on my show. Can you tell us about exogenous ketones, what they actually are? Yes, thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, First, I want to start out by saying thank you so much for having me on. You are absolutely extraordinary, and I'm so excited to do this podcast with you. Um, I also want to preface any of the information that we share is not intended to diagnose, prevent, treat, or cure any diseases. And if you're under any medical supervision, contact your medical provider before adding any new supplements or daily regimens into what you have going on. Um, The exogenous ketones I personally prefer are Pruvit's Pure Therapeutic Ketones. They're all de-isoform, which is more bioavailable, which means they're better absorbed because they're identical to what our body makes endogenously. Synthetic ketone supplements, which are typically mixed isomers, can be looked at like trying to fit a 100 different keys into the same lock hole. This means that most of them aren't making it through, if any at all. So your body won't absorb the synthetic ketones as well as it would the naturally fermented ketone supplements. When you consume these bioidentical isomers, it's like giving your body that one key to fit the lock, and that that lock unlocks the highest quality therapeutic state of ketosis. These ketone supplements usually constitute beta-hydroxybutyrate. They usually elevate your blood ketones in a short time to effectively induce acute ketosis. Sam, I love the sound of your voice from a closet. (laughs) I must say. But for the sake of redundancy, I feel like we should abbreviate exogenous ketones and let's call them EKs, which is kind of annoying. But from here in, I think everyone should hear us refer to those as EKs, exogenous ketones. And Sam, I have to be honest, when I first learned that EKs existed, I think I felt slighted in some weird sense. I mean, here I was putting in all this hard work, following a well-designed keto diet, ensuring, you know, I stayed under 30 net grams of carb each day, and I was pouring olive oil onto everything like it's water. And then along come these faker keto products claiming to deliver all the same benefits as the diet. I was a little incredulous, and I've always felt that there aren't shortcuts to health, including fitness, and that's exactly what these products promise. Yeah, I like to think of it as biohacking your way to the benefits. Since EKs don't require a dietary restriction of any kind, they can be used by anyone who wants the benefits of ketosis. When people start the keto diet, that metabolic transition towards fat adaption usually takes a few weeks, right? Mm -hmm. These products rapidly elevate your blood ketones to a therapeutic level, and with consistent daily supplementation, they keep you there. That is definitely a perk to EKs, not to mention avoiding that keto flu. Um, By drinking exogenous ketones, I feel like you deposit them right into your system. And so you bypass all those dreadful symptoms that I know I fought through while I was acclimating to the diet. And regretfully, I didn't take sodium supplementation seriously and I nearly fainted in a gym under a barbell (laughs) like three weeks in. 
I was so dizzy that my colleague had to come into the gym and escort me back to the lab and watch me cram a few teaspoons of salt in my mouth and some water to get some relief. And in fact, that's a nod to the little logo I picked for this episode is my colleague Erica having to put her arm around me and literally escort me back to work. It was just pretty, pretty dumb. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry you experienced that. Um, yeah, EKs bridge that critical transition zone where the brain lacks glucose for energy and the liver hasn't yet become fully efficient at generating ketones. That transition period is especially brutal for athletes as it can totally zap their power and strength until things optimize. In the same vein, another potential benefit of EKs are for folks who follow carb cycling routines like bodybuilders, triathletes, who vary their macros based on like training, volume, or intensity. Yeah, speaking of that carbohydrate periodization, that's exactly the way that I would tailor diet plans for the triathletes that I worked with. My point and another avenue where EKs could be an asset And it's what I like to call the metabolic purgatory. And that's kind of (laughs) that period when physically active people start the diet. And in my case, for a solid month after going keto, I definitely experienced a loss of power, especially climbing hills on the bike. And my 10K run pace legit went from a seven minute mile pace, which I you know, worked hard to get to, and it dropped to a nine minute mile pace. I should say it came up. So I really was slower, notably so, and I felt really spaced out. Well, if only you have known about EKs at that time, right? Yeah. You could have totally jumped right into ketosis and avoided that transition. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that brings us to one burning question on our listeners' minds, which is what are the physiological differences between following a ketogenic diet and using exogenous ketones for weight loss? So I'll give you the short answer, Sam, and then I'll back up and we'll get into mechanisms. So EKs do not directly cause stored body fat to be broken down, nor do they burn stored body fat directly as a fuel. That exogenous ketones actually suppress fat breakdown, and that's called lipolysis. And that's the opposite of what happens on that well-formulated ketogenic diet. So anyone who tells you otherwise just doesn't understand the biochemistry underlying how these supplements work. Now that caveat I meant is that EKs, exogenous ketones, can indirectly aid in weight loss for a few reasons, which we'll cover in detail today. EKs significantly lower blood sugar, which reduces the need for insulin, that hormone that puts sugar from the blood into the cell. EKs also suppress appetite through uh, altering levels of the hunger hormone known as ghrelin, and they also limit the liver's production of new sugars. So even for folks with like a high carb diet, their glycogen, which means body carbohydrate stores. They're going to be topped off, but drinking EKs will still act to lower their blood sugars and put them in ketosis. And I think that's what's remarkable. Yes, I agree. It's so important to differentiate between ketogenesis and ketosis. Someone drinking EKs from an outside source, from salts, or even from a precursor like MCT oil, They'll have the presence of ketones, but the source obviously isn't from stored fat. It's from what they've just ingested. But once blood ketone levels are above 0.5 millimolar, you're in ketosis, regardless of how you got there. So that's the difference. It's just biochemical. Indeed. And the takeaway is that those strategies shouldn't be assumed to, you know, have equivalent effects on body fat simply because they achieve similar blood ketones. And there's a classic study where EKs, and in this case it was beta hydroxybutyrate, was infused into humans and it resulted in a marked anti-lipolytic effect, which means that it hindered the breakdown of stored body fat. And again, that's an acute response. That doesn't mean that someone can't lose fat 
using these products. It just is speaking to, again, the, the chemistry behind how it works. So EKs are well documented to actually slow the rate of lipolysis within 30 minutes of ingesting. Lindsay, I have clients who are eating cake and chips, are still able to eat those things, who aren't following any specific diet, and they're drinking EKs daily and losing mass amounts of weight. How is it possible that mainlining ketone esters and depositing them right into the system could suppress fat breakdown? So there's actually an evolutionary reason that ketone bodies suppress their own production. And it's actually to conserve an essential level of body fat during a real like prolonged starvation which is another circumstance where we make ketones. And that self-suppression also prevents the acidosis that accompanies unrestrained ketogenesis when the body is burning too much fat, again, situation like starvation, right? And another way of saying that is that ketones exert negative feedback upon themselves by reducing the supply of fat to the liver which is where ketones are made. And ketogenesis is at its core, an adaptive you know, survival response just to an energy crisis. So it provides an alternative fuel for the brain, which can't utilize fat as a fuel. So when you drink ketones outright from a supplement, the body gets the message at that moment to conserve fat and stop sending it to the liver. Again, that's not to say the indirect methods that exogenous ketones work, like through appetite suppression and lowering blood sugars, can't be effective for weight loss. In fact, that's my hypothesis as to how they do help people lose weight. Hmm. Can you address how studies discern if and where body fat breakdown is happening in response to a dietary intervention? I'm referring to pharmacodynamics. Absolutely. So just as a quick like overview of storing and, and burning fat, we all store fat regardless of what diet we follow in the form of triglycerides, and that's throughout our body. But we also store it in muscle, and those are called intramuscular triglycerides. And these triglycerides break down into three fatty acids, meaning triglyceride and glycerol. And in uh, rodent studies, EKs were fed to mice and then fat biopsies were taken from them. And then local blood flow was measured to determine how much glycerol was released from the stored fat. And they found that feeding mice exogenous ketones inhibited the breakdown of fat. Now, for people on a keto diet, carbohydrate restriction is at the underlying cause or the crux of low blood sugar and insulin. And those factors are what conspire together to augment the breakdown of stored body fat into those free fatty acids, which are then made into ketones by the liver. So again, to simplify, nutritionally induced ketones, the ones through the diet, they're composed of fats that have been liberated from stored body fat. Got ya. So since both roads to ketosis share the effect of decreasing blood sugars and lipids, would you say there's potential for EKs as an adjunct therapy for managing type 2 diabetes? So research has mostly looked um, in that area at a compound called 3-hydroxylbutyl-3-hydroxypeterate. <laughs> a mouthful. <laughs> now, while a significant reduction in blood glucose was shown in the literature with exogenous ketones. The study only had six subjects, which is obviously a weak sample size. But in healthy people, a single dose of EKs prior to a glucose tolerance test, which is what you get if you are going to be um, diagnosed for type 2 diabetes, that test significantly reduced the area under the curve, meaning how well the person could tolerate a sugary test drink. So in that regard, exogenous ketones had a significant impact in how you process sugars. And 
ketone esters, I know, are capable of driving blood ketones up higher than even a ketogenic diet can. The effects of exogenous ketones on long-term control of blood sugar have yet to be studied, especially in type 2 diabetics. Gotcha. So are there any other differences that apply here between nutritional ketosis and exogenous supplements? Mm, the only thing I can think of is that for people on the diet, the liver makes a steady supply of ketones and continuously sort of time releases them into circulation. In contrast, exogenous ketones are more like a bolus load that doesn't mimic that natural or endogenous release pattern. So to me, that makes the case for why it's important to drink exogenous ketones frequently, like more than once a day or at a minimum every day so you get the maximal impact. All right. Well, now that we've uncovered the different mechanisms behind endogenous and exogenous ketosis and body fat, we should move along to the shared benefits of both types. I can start with a short list, and then we can touch on each point in greater depth. Yeah, sounds great. In summary, the purported benefits associated with ketosis, regardless of how you got there, includes improved athletic performance, sparing of lean muscle mass with weight loss, limiting post-exercise muscle damage, enhanced cognition, reducing reducing risk of diabetes and heart disease, the general antioxidant and anti-inflammatory benefits. Did I miss any, Lindsay? No, but it really sounds like ketosis is like a panacea for all things, doesn't it? Like, uh, can ketosis <laughs> homeschool our children and wash our dishes? I don't know. Can it cook me dinner and clean my house too, please? <laughs> I wish. And in the interest of time, I feel like we should just wrap up with how EKs can do two things, which are preserve lean muscle mass and aid in exercise recovery. So I'll get started with that. Um, and the first point is regarding the anti-catabolic and anabolic effects from muscle. And this should be of particular interest to people who lift weights. So research has recently made a significant contribution to this area by examining both the potential of beta hydroxybutyrate in muscle under acute inflammation, as well as exogenous ketones in looking at post-exercise conditions. Yeah, and this is salient because dramatic losses of muscle are also observed in people diagnosed with cancer, HIV, heart and renal failure, and rheumatoid and osteoarthritis. Even post-surgery, there is risk for muscle atrophy. And Sam, let's not forget about the gradual muscle loss that occurs with aging. I am 43 after all. Um, you may laugh, but I'm telling you, not a year goes by <laughs> that it feels like an uphill battle to, you know, stay yoked. And in my early 40s, I definitely feel if I take a week off from strength training, where in my 30s, it didn't matter as much. I don't know. I can't really speak to that at my youthful age of 32. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> back to skeletal muscle health. From understanding, isn't that really just about muscle protein turnover? Mm -hmm. Yeah, dietitians call that nitrogen balance. And that's because all proteins are mostly made of nitrogen. And protein turnover is sort of that interplay that's continually happening between synthesis and degradation of muscle. And muscle cells have a high affinity for ketone bodies, even at rest. Uh, muscle is the primary tissue utilizing ketones. And muscles actually convert acetoacetate into beta-hydroxybutyrate, and both of those are ketone bodies. And the other thing to know is that Ketone bodies have long been hypothesized to be protein sparing or anti-catabolic and research that takes muscle biopsies from humans and then measures protein kinetics confirm that idea. And infusions of EKs have had a robust anti-catabolic response. Okay, quick question. Before the advent of EKs, 
Were there any promising supplements that could preserve lean muscle mass? Mm -hmm. There was strong evidence that the branch chain amino acid leucine is particularly beneficial. In fact, I have to give a shout to my colleague, Donnie Gregg, because he is an expert in muscle physiology. And I learned from him that leucine directly targets a major anabolic protein like mTOR, which is mammalian target of rapamycin. He will be proud to hear that I know what that means. <laughs> and <laughs> most studies that look at the muscle preserving effects of ketones are actually pretty ambiguous. So I'm going to highlight two that are clear. One study showed an infusion of EKs directly decreased nitrogen excretion. Remember I said that nitrogen is what makes up protein, right? Mm -hmm. So EKs decreased nitrogen excretion in urine by 30% in fasting humans. And as you know, fasting is a time that your body would start to look to other sources of a fuel, right? So muscle mass is included in that. And that's why starving children in other countries have a protein wasting disease. And then the second study showed beta hydroxybutyrate infusion decreased leucine oxidation by 30% and significantly increase muscle synthesis in healthy people. So now that we know EKs can be a complementary strategy for optimizing muscle protein synthesis, those findings seem to suggest EKs may have promising application for the post-exercise period. So can we explore the evidence for EKs as a recovery aid since they are a way to biohack your way into acute ketosis? Yeah, certainly. That becomes a question in my mind, Sam, of restoring muscle glycogen after training. Like, how can we amplify that? And during that post-exercise recovery window, and I'm saying this with air quotes window, it's really a 30-minute window where the muscle is hungry to replenish glycogen because there's an enzyme called glycogen synthase. And so that becomes the metabolic priority, even for people following a ketogenic diet. So once a person does become fat adapted, their liver converts lactate, a metabolic byproduct, into glucose, and then it redistributes that to the muscle. And that's how it replenishes muscle glycogen. So ketone bodies actually speed up that glycogen conversion rate. It's amazing. Okay, wait, so you're saying even athletes on a keto diet use glycogen during moderate intensity and maximal exercise? They don't solely rely on ketones for fuel? Yeah, that's right. So our metabolic system, as you know, is remarkably flexible, and it can use a variety of macros as a fuel. And in the exercise lab that I work in, I can actually see real time what fuel source people are burning while they're like running on a treadmill. And we measure the person's RQ or respiratory quotient. And we do that by giving them a VO2 max test. And I actually did this for a semi pro crew triathlete. So she, and she rows across the ocean and follows a ketogenic diet. While her RQ was lower than a person who eats like a standard, you know, higher carb Western diet, the test revealed that she still uses glycogen at those higher intensities. There's no getting around that. And in a study by Jeff Bullock, he conducted one in ultra endurance athletes. And after three hours of submaximal exercise, muscle glycogen decreased in both keto adapted and regular diet athletes with no differences between them. So some studies show that keto adaptation might slow glycogen depletion, but it can't prevent it. And these results imply to me a role for EKs in the conservation of glycogen stores. And after a workout, elevations in uh, glucose and lactate ultimately are gonna limit the production of new ketones, and that's why people who follow the diet aren't gonna see a peak elevation in blood ketones until like 90 minutes to two hours after the workout. And that's because they've just used up all their ketones to fuel the workout and they take time to regenerate. Here's the thought. If people already following a keto diet co-ingested EKs with 
a small dose of carbs within 30 minutes of their workout, wouldn't that be a metabolic hack of sorts for replacing glycogen within muscle? In short, yes. If athletes included EKs in their like recovery protocol, that would confer a great metabolic advantage. And there's a preliminary abstract from 2016, and I cite that in our references, where well-trained military servicemen increase their muscle glycogen by 50% way after the recovery window, two hours after exercise. And that was after exogenous ketones were superimposed with a dose of carbs. So they did both. They had the supplement and probably like a 30 gram carbohydrate dose. And the two in combo really helped them replenish glycogen. Wow. Well, I hope all our endurance athletes out there heard that. (laughs) Sounds promising. Mm -hmm. Well, my kids are finally asleep, and I have been on Zoom meetings since about 8 a.m., and I think it's time to wrap it up. To our listeners, stay tuned for part two of this series. We're going to tackle the effects of EKs on appetite suppression and satiety next time, as well as the findings for exercise performance. Night, Lynn's. Night, Sam.